I remember years ago we were in Mississippi and there's a stretch of highway and there came one of those terrible tornadoes and a bridge was washed out in the gush of water and a man got out at night when he saw what had happened and he tried to wave the cars down uh, with, his, with his wet handkerchief and a flashlight and none of them would stop and five of them went over and the occupants of the cars were killed. Now Jesus cured a mentally ill person one time, the Gadarene, and a demon-possessed man, and the people asked Jesus to leave them alone. And he answered their prayers. He left them alone. You don't have to listen to this sermon tonight. You can say, I don't want to hear about it. Leave me alone. And Jesus may answer your prayer and leave you alone. And if you are left alone by the Spirit of God, you can never find forgiveness of sin and you can never enter paradise. People do not want to be warned of judgment in hell. And you say, it's none of my business. Well, suppose you were a drowning man and I have the gospel lifeboat and I'm not going to let you drown if I can help it. You're a starving man and I have the bread of life and I'll not leave you without some bread. You're a poison man full of the poison of sin and I have Christ's gospel antidote and I will not leave you to die. I will not leave you alone. You're in the dark and lost and I have the light of the gospel and I'll not leave you alone. You're in bondage and I would speak the truth that would bring you to liberty. You're in sickness and I would speak the truth that would bring you to health. You're on a broad road that leads to destruction and I speak the truth that would get you transferred to the narrow road that leads to eternal life. You're on a wild stormy sea and I would speak the truth that would bring you to the harbor of safety. And then Jesus constantly taught it. Nobody in scripture talked about hell more than Jesus. He said, whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. He said in the 13th of Matthew, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 25, 41, he says, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands and to go to hell. He said it's better to go through life with just one eye, one hand, one leg than to go to hell with it all. There is hell in the heart. Thousands of people here tonight have hell in your heart. And that's where it all begins. Much of the world assumes that human nature is good, but the Bible teaches that it's basically evil. By nature, we are selfish, sinful, wayward, and lost. In sin did my mother conceive me, said David. We're all sinners and we were born in sin. And then when we reach the age of accountability, maybe seven, eight, or nine, or 10 years of age, we chose to sin. Then we became sinners by practice. And we practice sin, even if we have computers. We're using computers today for fraud and all sorts of things. And then all this thing out here, we're looking for marijuana plants out in the forest and everywhere where people are planting them. Everywhere you look and whatever investigating committee you appoint, you turn up some snakes because human nature is evil. Human nature is bad. And that's the reason it needs redemption. It needs transforming. It needs the new birth. And that's what Christ came to do. There's the hell of guilt. A man who wrote me some time ago who uh, was cheating on his wife. He was living part-time with another woman in another city. And he said, I'm actually living in hell. He found himself caught. And it was hell. And the Bible teaches that there's a burning, death-dealing hell in the human heart. And the very people seem so good, wholesome, and splendid may be changed into vicious killers and maniacs overnight. I know a woman, a fine woman, beautiful woman. Her husband was one of the leaders of the community. And without hardly any provocation at all, while he was asleep, she took a pistol and shot him, killed him. She's in prison now. And we read about that every day in the paper. People, they say that were good people, fine people, are doing all sorts of things that they never dreamed that they would be doing. So there's that in the heart, guilt. Then there's the hell of unrest. The Bible states the wicked are like the troubled sea. People this past summer, we saw in Europe, we went to Amsterdam for that great conference on itinerant evangelists, which I think was one of the greatest conferences held in the history of the Christian church. And yet we met many other people who were there just searching for something. They didn't know what. I saw Americans and people from Japan and everywhere else running as though their life depended on it. They didn't know where they were going or what they were doing. They were just going, trying to find some rest and peace. There's the hell of lust. 
She that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. Someone asked me the other day what the word lust means. I'll talk a little about it tomorrow night to young people. But lust means not to just look at a woman or a man and admire them. It means that if you had the opportunity, you would commit immorality. In other words, you lust so much you would give in if you had the chance. And many people fantasize and they lust in their fantasies. And then there's the hell of hatred. This hell of hatred has erupted into wars and riots and all kinds of conflicts. Hell has been moved to earth. And lastly, there's the hell in the future. And the future hell is a projection of the hell that you have now in your heart, in your home, in our world, except it goes on and on. Jesus spoke more about hell than any person in the Bible, as I said a moment ago, but he warned us to flee from it. It is the very fact of hell that makes the love of God so amazing and so glorious. The fact that it was made for the devil and his angels and we listened to the devil and followed the devil and we do what the devil says. And yet God loves us so much that he devised a plan to save us so that we'll never have to spend one day in hell. Now what is the nature of hell? Well, many mysteries surrounding this subject. Essentially and basically, it is separation from God. We're separated from God by sin, and that continues out into eternity. And there are three words that Jesus used to describe hell. He used the word death. You see, God is life, and you're separated from the life of God. You're dead, spiritually dead, separated from God. And then he used the word out of darkness. God is light. We're separated from the light. So we live in darkness. And then he uses the word fire. And I've often wondered if that is a terrible fire within our hearts for God, for fellowship with God that can never be quenched. We've rejected God. We've turned our back on God. We can never know God. It indicates in this story that this man did not have a second chance. It indicates in this story that this man became very evangelistic. He wanted to reach his brothers. Think of it, he was in hell. And he wanted his brothers to be reached by somebody. To go to his home and warn his brothers not to come here. Do anything but not, don't come here. And those people that have gone on before, that may be suffering the pangs of hell now out in eternity, would stand here tonight and warn you Turn away, repent of your sins, receive Christ, be sure of your relationship. Don't come to this place.